come uh, to this wonderful city. I'm very sorry that I am not able uh, to speak Spanish, but I will try to speak as clearly as possible in English. And uh, Pepe Cid has very kindly translated my slides into Spanish so that you can see them uh, in Spanish. <clears throat> the title of my talk, as you will see, uh, is very general. Uh, in English, the, it's the desistance research and its relevance for criminology and criminal policy. When I accepted this very kind invitation, I, asked the, I gave the organizers several possibilities about desistance, but they wanted me to talk in this rather general way about uh, desistance research in general, to give an overview of desistance research uh, from my perspective, of course, uh, so that uh, we could perhaps begin this conference with a, a general view of the different approaches that, that different people have brought. Uh, to the subject of desistance. Uh, I will say at the beginning that my own view in this subject, as in many other subjects, uh, is that we get the best results in criminology from synthesis, that is from taking seriously what different people, psychologists, sociologists, lawyers, philosophers, and so on, what these different people are saying, and of course, not accepting everything, but thinking about the best insights that these different people can bring, and then thinking carefully about how we, how we can synthesize these insights. And this is what I am going to do this morning. So <clears throat> the topics I am going to discuss, discuss are, first of all, some research findings, uh, secondly, some implications for criminology, and thirdly, some implications for criminal policy. And I will begin with uh, research findings, and I've decided to simply list some major research findings and then discuss briefly uh, some aspects of these research findings. And the first research finding is really important but criminal, criminology in the past, and in particular, I think, criminal policy has not always taken it as seriously as it should be taken. And this is the simple fact that most offenders, even most persistent offenders, eventually desist. And obviously, and we will come back to this, an obvious possibility for criminal policy is, well, if most offenders are going to desist anyway, wouldn't it be nice if we could help them a, a little bit along the way, to help them to desist a little bit quicker? This is a very familiar curve for all criminologists. This one happens to be from England and Wales, but there will be identical ones in Spain. We call it in English the age crime curve. This is all identified offenders in one year in England and Wales. The uh, higher group are males, the lower group are females. Uh, and you can see the spike uh, at a 19 for males and a little bit earlier for females. We all know this. I will not spend time on it. What is not, what you cannot, it's very important to see that you cannot draw from that curve, which is a cross-sectional curve. It's a cross-section of all offenders in a given year. You cannot infer from that what is happening to somebody over a criminal career because about half of the people in this graph are first offenders who will never reappear in the system. So a large part of our age crime curve looked at cross-sectionally is of people who only appear once. So what happens when you look at more persistent offenders and look at their age crime curve? 
Well, there are, for reasons of practicality, there are very many fewer longitudinal age crime curves following people over a life course. There are many fewer of those than there are cross-sectional age crime curves. But one of the most famous was provided by Laub and Sampson, American criminologists, uh, based on a study that was originally done by Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck. Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck, a husband and wife American criminology team, studied some um, boys in uh, Massachusetts who had originally been in a reform school in Massachusetts in the late 1930s. And Samson and Laub were able to follow these men up until their 70s. It's only a smallish group, 500, but we can see their age crime curve over their whole lifetime, and that's what it looks like. You can see that it is almost identical to the uh, age crime curve, uh, the cross-sectional age crime curve which is surprising, but interesting. Of course, as I said, that is only a study of 500 people. Fortunately, we do have uh, a, a, much larger a much larger longitudinal study based in the Netherlands, and this is a study of um, the whole of the Netherlands population uh, over a long period. What is important in this slide, I will speak loud, is these figures. This means single offender. There's actually 70% of those. This is low rate desisters. This is medium rate desisters. And this is high rate desisters. Persistence. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, in this study, unlike the Laub Sampson study, uh, there is a group of persisters carrying on until they are 70. Uh, but even this group uh, is very small. You can see it is only 1.6%. Also, this group is not uh, a, a particularly violent group. In fact, they consist mainly of persistent petty thieves. So th these are relatively low-level offenders. So the great majority of offenders desist. And that's the most important of finding of number one. So number two, which in a way we've already looked at, is that the early 20s are the fastest, the period of fastest deceleration of offending uh, within a criminal career. And here is another study. This is the famous Cambridge study of delinquent development uh, carried out by uh, David Farrington and others. And if you look at the heading, this consists uh, of chronic offenders within the Cambridge study. Chronic offenders are defined as those with four or more convictions. And it's important to say that these chronic offenders within the Cambridge study are responsible for more than half of all the offences in the whole sample. So, and we know this, of course, that chronic offenders are responsible for a lot of offences. So these chronic offenders, again, the uh, period of fastest deceleration of offending uh, is in the early 20s. But I don't want to uh, over-exaggerate this finding. This I don't want you to worry about the details of this graph. This is, in fact, the same group as we saw 
there, it, it is that group looked at again, but in more detail, breaking them down into categories. And if you add all these up, you will get the peak again and the early 20s. But I want to show you in particular this small group um, of people who are called the high-rate chronics, uh, who carry on offending until their 30s, and then uh, they stop. Uh, or at least then they start de decreasing. Now, it's important to say this because most of our research has been on resistance in the 20s, and it seems reasonably clear that the, this group who carry on till the 30s uh, are probably in some ways different, but we don't yet know in exactly what ways they're different. And this is an illustration of the fact that desistance research is still uh, very much a work in progress. So moving on to the third research finding, uh, here I would like to introduce my own study of uh, desistance, which I carried out in Sheffield and uh, as Pepe Cid might have told you about in Spanish, I don't know, uh, <laughs> um, which was a study of uh, desistance in the city of Sheffield where I used to work and where I went back uh, to the last empirical research of my career. I went back to Sheffield with, to work with Joanna Shapland on this study of desistance. The reason I went back uh, is because I now work in Cambridge, but Cambridge is a very beautiful city. I'm sure some of you have been there, but it is pretty bad for doing criminology. There are not enough offenders. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I had to go back to Sheffield uh, to do the study. Um, what we did, because we knew from statistical studies that the age, ages 20 were the most, was the fastest period of deceleration of offending, we decided to take a group of offenders age 20 and we wanted to look particularly at persistent offenders. We were fortunate, I will not go through the details, but we were fortunate that the, we did manage to get a, a smallish group, about 110 offenders, a smallish group of very persistent offenders. In England, uh, it's a bit different from Spain. In England, you can be convicted from age 10 onwards. And between the ages of 10 and 20, this group of 110 people had acquired, on average, eight convictions eight convictions between age 10 and age 20. So you can see they were a quite persistent group. And what did we find when we asked them in the first, we, what we did is we interviewed them four times uh, over a three year period. There was no intervention, we simply interviewed them. Uh, and we asked them in the first interview what kind of person would you like to become in the next few years? And this was the answer they gave. And you can see that the majority responses were to go straight, to be drug free, to be alcohol free, to live a normal life, to be a good person, to be responsible, to be a family man, they were all males. Uh, one group says to be successful, but that doesn't mean to be rich. There's a very small group at the bottom who say they would like to be rich. When we looked in more detail at these successful people, they mean live a regular life, be normal, and so on. So the great majority of this sample of very persistent offenders age 20 said, we would like to be normal. And that's very interesting, and again is perhaps hopeful from the point of view 
of the correctional services. Now another thing we know, the fourth finding, is that the factors influencing uh, going into delinquency are not necessarily the same as the factors that promote an exit from crime. They might be the same, but they might not. For example, if someone uh, is uh, a violent offender, it might well be that the way out of crime for that offender is to do an anger management course, in which case the, what the factors leading to the coming out are very much connected to the factors coming in. But this is not necessarily the case. It is often the case that what, change, what allows an offender to change is the fact that uh, he, is, he or she is finding new interests, new relationships, and that these new things are causing the change. And this was first pointed out by uh, Laub and Samson, the American criminologists who did the the follow-up study of the Gluck's sample because they found that marriage and a steady and steady employment uh, were very helpful uh, in uh, leading to a, ch to a change in, in crime. Uh, and subsequently we have found in more detail from other studies that this is very much the case. So, uh, we need to look not only at what has happened in the past, but also at possibilities for the future. And this was well expressed by one probationer uh, in a study by an English criminologist called Stephen Farrell. And perhaps you can uh, read it uh, quickly in Spanish. And you see that he's saying, yeah, and he is actually in some ways complaining about his probation experience. He's, if you look at the end of the quotation, the whole probation order seems to be about going back, 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 looking backwards at what I've been doing. But we, yes, I can see that you have to do that to some extent, but we need also to think, he says at the beginning of the quotation, we need to think about something to show people what they're capable of doing. So we need to look forward as well as back. So the fifth finding is that delink, delink, sorry, desistance is often a persistent process for persistent offenders. And uh, we found this in the Sheffield study. Remember in the Sheffield study, we had four interviews, and uh, if you look at the uh, total reconvictions, um, it is, uh, this was, remember, a very persistent offending group, and in the whole uh, three to four year follow-up period, 80% of them were reconvicted. This is not a great surprise, they were persistent offenders. If you look at a simple binary reconviction rate between interviews one and two, two and three, and three and four, again, the actual reconviction rates are high. But if you look at the frequency of offending, in the year before the first interview, it was on, on this is on official crime, it was eight crimes. In the year between the third and the fourth interviews, it was two and a half. So although there was a lot of reconviction going on, the frequency was declining. And that illustrates the fact that desistance is often a gradual process. People, particularly persistent offenders, do not stop suddenly. So why does this happen? Well, if you think about it, it's really not very hard to understand. 
because here are people who have become very used to committing a lot of offenses. The self-report studies in uh, our, the self-report, self-reported crime in our Sheffield study showed that most of the offenders had committed at least 50 offenses in the last year and some of them had committed 150. So offending was a way of life in a way. So asking people like that and most of their friends were offenders. So asking people like that suddenly to stop offending is asking a lot. So uh, what they do, in fact, is they want to change, they begin to change, they change some aspects of their lives, but they don't quickly change everything. And uh, so perhaps when there is a financial crisis, the first uh, the first suggestion is, well, I'll go shoplifting or something like that. Anyway, this is very interesting data, I think, showing the gradual nature uh, of desistance. So now we come to the heart of the problem. Exactly why does desistance happen? How do we understand how desistance happens? Now, I have to tell you that the request of the Spanish Society of Criminology Organizing Committee to give you a general overview of desistance research is at this point rather challenging because there are many different views on how desistance uh, occurs and uh, to some extent there is conflict within uh, criminology about what these different factors are and I am only going to give you my own view <laughs> of uh, how, how this works but in general there are five different uh, views on the kinds of things that are relevant uh, to desistance and they are at the top age and maturation and it's now becoming clear that maturation is the more important of those two. Then the effects of the justice system. Then over here social bonds and social support. Then over here the offender's own view his attempt to change and then in the middle particularly situations that are encountered or that the offender tries to deal with. Now I believe that each of these five things is relevant. People dispute which is the most relevant <laughs> I will not enter into those disputes, uh, but I think each of them is in a way relevant. And my own view is that they all interact in complicated ways. I have divided them into the top two, which I describe as background factors because they are not about the immediate circumstances of the offender, whereas the ones at the bottom, social bonds, situations and agency and identity, these are more about uh, a particular set of circumstances immediately encountered by the offender. The other two are more like background factors. Okay, so the first one is not a very well-known study and uh, oh sorry this is <laughs> it helps to read it in English as well uh, <laughs> this I'm now exploring the background factors okay which is the criminal justice system and maturation and this first finding 
uh, is not very well known, and this study is not very well known, but it is interesting. And Pepe Sid, when I was discussing the translation with him, said, when you show this slide, you must explain that this is a quotation in, <laughs> in quotation marks. It's not what you, are, you, Tony Bottoms, are saying. It's what John McLeod said. That's true. It's not what I'm saying. It's what John McLeod said. So why did he say it? Why did he say that the most important influence on, on desistance is getting convicted? Well, this is a purely statistical study which did not collect any information about the social lives of men and women. It was simply a statistical study based on criminal careers in England. What they found, he and his colleagues, was that the cumulative effect of the criminal justice system uh, was extremely important in leading to desistance. Perhaps an easier way of explaining this is that when you get to about the fourth or fifth conviction, after that, about 80% each further conviction, about 80% re-offend. And we saw that in the Sheffield study where there was a reconviction rate of 80% uh, with that group who had eight convictions. But if you think about it, if every time you get a further conviction, only, only 80% are re-convicted, re then uh, there will be a gradual diminution in the total number of people who are uh, in the system. And this, as I said, this is a purely statistical study, but we can see the effect of this when we look at the lives of offenders. And we will see this in a case study uh, a little later the sense that my life is going nowhere. I am continually being reconvicted. This is not a good way to lead a life. So in this way, so this is not about the specific effects of imprisonment or the specific effects of probation or anything like that. It's simply that if you carry on with this way of life, and keep getting convicted, this is not a sensible way to live. And eventually this leads to a sense that we have to change. So in that sense, it's a very important background factor. Whether it's the most important background factor, I do not affirm. <laughs> okay, so maturation. Well, in recent years, some of you will know this, there is evidence from <clears throat> um, uh, neuropsychological studies that the brain develops really quite late. The prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is particularly uh, concerned with impulsivity uh, and impulse control, um, this does not fully develop until the person is about age 25. So obviously, this, might, this purely physiological change might be implicated in the fact that uh, desistance, the fastest period of deceleration, is in the early 20s. But it's also the case that criminologists have not taken much interest, and this is a quote from the Danish criminologist Britta Kuvsgaard, criminology, she says, has paid little attention to the subjective aspects of maturation. People's personal philosophy, their perception of their place in the world, the, and the potential connection that such things have uh, with changes in offending. 
And an American psychologist called Jeffrey Arnett has uh, argued on the basis of empirical studies that one of the most important factors in this subjective dimension of maturation is the notion of taking responsibility for oneself. And his colleague, um, uh, Jennifer Tanner, his colleague Jennifer Tanner, has spoken also of the notion of recentering, by which she means that this period of early adulthood is a critical phase during which individuals select their life goals. So, uh, at considerable risk, I will ask you to think about your own lives. Uh, in my own case, uh, I will be autobiographical for a moment. In my own case, the period between 20 and 25 was crucial in two very important ways. One, I found my life's partner, Janet, who unfortunately is not able to be with me this week, uh, but we married between 20 and 25, and also in the same period I became a criminologist, and I still am. So, uh, and if you think about your own life, I will not invite you to um, reflect on this aloud, but if you think about your own life, you probably will find some important decisions that you made between 20 and 25. And this is what these uh, psychologists are saying. This is a very important period in people's lives. They think about their lives, they recenter their lives, and one of the most important things is beginning to take responsibility for yourself and the direction that your life uh, is taking. And perhaps the most important uh, criminologist emphasizing this aspect of desistance is uh, Edward Mulvey, who heads the Pathways to Desistance project in Pittsburgh. And he has written a very good paper on, on that study in this book, Global Perspectives on Desistance, which came out only two months ago, uh, and which is edited by Joanna Shaplin, Stephen Farrell, and myself. And it arises from a conference that was held in Sheffield uh, two years ago. And uh, I will mention that book later. There is a, uh, an opportunity to buy a discounted version in your packs. Um, but uh, that, in that book, um, Ed Mulvey talks about the uh, the importance of uh, development, developmental studies, and in particular uh, the, um, uh, the importance of maturation. And he, he and his team have produced this extremely important finding. Uh, I will not go through the different categories in detail, but what is really interesting is that this dark line is persisters and this dotted line is desisters. And this is um, what he calls temperance, which is basically impulse control at age 14, and this is impulse control at age 25. And so these are two separate measurements. One is purely psychological about impulse control, and one is the, what has happened to their criminal career during this period. And you can see uh, that the persisters have relatively low impulse control throughout, whereas the desisters manage to improve their impulse control during the same period. And this is a very important finding because some criminologists like Gottfriedson and Hershey have suggested that impulse control remains the same throughout life, and this is actually a falsification uh, of that theory. So what we don't know still, I mean, this is only a first finding, what we don't know is exactly how this happens, 
but it is a very important finding in suggesting that maturation is very relevant to desistance. So now we come to perhaps the most contentious part of this talk, which is exploring the foreground factors where uh, we're trying to look at uh, the aspects that are more, more in the mind of the offender, so the social factors, the situations, uh, and, the, uh, and the way in which the offender takes decisions. The classic study here is again by Laub and Sampson who were very important in the not very long history of desistance studies in criminology. And Laub and Sampson uh, talk about social bonds and it's quite important to understand how their study was done. For a long time they simply studied the statistics and they found that if the effects on recidivism were apparent for marriage and for stable employment over and above any uh, predictive risk factors uh, that were apparent in, uh, uh, in adolescence. So they're saying that these new factors this is the, 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 the asymmetric uh, causation, the new factors appearing, the new factors that they particularly emphasized were marriage, employment, and because these men had, quite a lot of them had served in the Second World War, uh, military service. And these had created new social bonds which had taken the men away from crime. But the emphasis was on this being really rather external. And indeed, they used the phrase desistance by default. That is, that men got into these new situations of the military, a marriage, or employment, and then before they realized it, they were beginning to change. Subsequently, um, War, another American criminologist, uh, spoke about the possibility that peer groups might be uh, as important as marriage because what happens in marriage is that you concentrate your attention uh, on your partner and start to leave behind your delinquent friends. I don't think that's an either or. I think that both things happen, but we'll leave that aside. But the main thing here is that this is it, is, it is social bonds, that, but these social bonds are really quite external and uh, they are very much to do with conventional uh, social adult, adult social life. The next theory is by Peggy Giordano uh, and uh, others. And Peggy Giordano has written a superb update of this theory, of her theory, in this uh, recent book. Um, it is called the Cognitive Transformation Approach. She based it on a study in Ohio in the United States. And basically what she said is, yes, Sampson and Laub have found some interesting things, but actually the offender is more active than they suggested. The offender, it's not just that he gets into marriages, work, uh, military service, it's that the offender thinks about things and, and the, what the offender is thinking is relevant to change. That's why it's called a cognitive transformation approach. But as you can see from the subtitle, this is a rather social version of cognitive transformation. And she's looking at the way in which the cognitive transformation is also related to social factors. I will not go through these different dimensions. Basically, she, it starts with a, a shift in the offender's willingness to change, 
gradually it becomes a transformation uh, in the way in which he views deviant behavior. In her later work, this is based on her earlier work, in her later work she says that perhaps this 1, 2, 3, 4 was too rigid uh, and it's more flexible than that, but it's useful to set out the four phases so that you can see them. So then we have another agency-based approach. This is by Paternoster and Bushway. Uh, personally, I am less attracted to this theory because it is almost exclusively individualistic uh, and emphasizes rational choice and cost-benefit analysis. The offender makes a cost-benefit analysis I don't deny that the offend at offenders do do cost-benefit analysis, but there is much else going on as well. Nevertheless, Paternoster and Bushway's theory is important because they introduced into the criminological literature a set of terms which are actually very helpful, which is that the offender thinks about his possible self. What kind of person would I like to be? Uh, and that is contrasted with his current working self. And when he thinks about his possible self, he's thinking about a, a possible good self, but also a feared self. And that notion picked up from McLeod of... I am going to keep going back to prison. This is not a good way of living. That very much, this is the subjective version of McLeod's theory, basically, uh, saying the feared self-dimension. But then the main Spanish contribution to uh, the desistance literature has come from uh, Professor Sid and also his colleague Professor Marti, uh, and they have introduced an interesting new dimension into the theoretical debate, which is based on the notion of social support. And they link this to the uh, general strain theory of Agnew. And they say, yes, delinquency quite often occurs because of general strain, but an antidote to strain is support. And they, in, based on uh, studies of a small number of ex-prisoners in Catalonia, they show that there was a big difference between those who were supported by relatives when they were in prison and those who were not. And they also show, and this I think is a cultural difference between Spain and certainly America, that because of the strength of the family bonds in Spain, there was a strong sense that since my family has chosen to support me while I am in prison, then I owe them a reciprocal obligation to try to do something in exchange. And that something is very much trying to desist. I think I've got this right, more or less. <laughs> um, and, of course, there is some similarity in this theory to the Samson and Lab social bonds theory, but it is different because it is not just about getting into social relationships that directly lead to your desistance. It is about a more general social support that helps you through a period of desistance. And they actually suggest that uh, in uh, Catalonia, in their sample, the social support theory, actually, they said that there was some support for each of the three theories of Sampson and Lab and uh, Giordano and, uh, and, and social support, but on balance there was more support for the 
uh, for the social support theory than from the others. My own view is that these theories can complement each other and, and should be all seen uh, as potentially relevant. I'm going to skip that and I want to now introduce the, if we go right back, that one, okay, we've talked about the background factors, talked about social support, talked about agency, so the one thing I haven't talked about is situational factors. But it's also clear that situations can influence desistance and the most rigorous, exam the most rigorous uh, demonstration of that is through uh, the uh, study uh, in uh, the United States uh, following the uh, large floods uh, in the south of the country, you remember when many people were made homeless, and uh, somebody called Dr. Kirk, who's now very sensibly moved to England, uh, but he did a study comparing those who were able to return home after the floods and those who were the prisoners who were able to return home after the floods and those who were not because their home had disappeared or was uninhabitable. And he found that those uh, who were obliged to move to another neighborhood actually had lower reconviction rates. It was a kind of quasi-experimental study. So in that study, the situation had changed uh, the subsequent offending levels. Now, of course, you cannot translate that into a general policy of make, make everybody move home. Uh, but um, where are, yeah. But it is very interesting that uh, offenders themselves realize the importance of situations. And in the Sheffield study, we looked at this through the concepts of synchronic and diachronic self-control. Self-control in this analysis is not a kind of general personality trait. It's something we do when we are tempted. So, if I am trying to lose weight and I very much like cream cakes, I need to avoid eating cream cakes. Now, I can do this just by having a strong will, and every time I see a cream cake, I say no. But I can also do it by avoiding situations in which I will see a cream cake by not going into those shops. And this is essentially what uh, diachronic self-control is about. It's about organizing your life so that you do not get into situations where you will be tempted and where you think in advance that you might well, you know, be unable to resist the temptation. And in the Sheffield study, once we had become aware of this issue, what we did was we actually asked questions about it and we found that actually a majority of those who were trying to desist were engaging in this kind of situational planning of their lives so as to avoid dangerous situations because they knew that if they met with their old friends, there was quite a possibility that they would say, oh, come on, Pepe, let's go and offend. Or, <laughs> or <laughs> uh, if they went to a particular bar, then it was quite likely that a fight would develop and they would join in. 
So these kinds of situational tactics uh, actually are very important and our study is the first one, other studies have mentioned it, but our study is the first one to highlight it as an important part of d desistance strategies, uh, which it is. So I try to illustrate the fact that these things uh, come together through the case of Len, who was an offender in the Sheffield study. And at the first interview, he was age 20, he was on probation, he'd been convicted on eight occasions, he'd served a 12-month period in a young offenders institution. Crucially, he was now homeless. But a probation officer had helped him, and his relationship with his mother had broken down, but a probation officer helped him to go into a hostel in the city centre. He said, and this was quite typical at the first offence, I feel no shame for my offences. Uh, and he said, Must, most of them are drug related and when you're on drugs you don't care. But now, he said, I want to stop because I'm absolutely sick of this. Every day I wake up and I have to, if, when I'm homeless, I have to find money, I have to find something to eat, day after day after day, and this is no way to live. It's the negative, it's the negative impulse to start changing. This is no way to live. I need to start changing. Okay. He begins to change, and his relationship with his mother begins to improve although his mother still lives three miles away uh, in the suburbs. One day, he meets an old friend, and his old friend says, Len, let's go drinking. So they go drinking. They drink too much. They steal a car. They get caught because the car is not being driven well. They get convicted of taking a car and drunk driving. Len realizes that his attempt to change has suddenly hit a major obstacle. And he says, this, I really do have to change now. So, uh, because his relationship with his mother had been improving, he says, I'm going to go and live with my mother which he does, so she provides him with some social support. But also during his time at the hostel, he had been getting some informal support from a woman, an older woman teacher who he had met in a cafe and who acted as a kind of counselor for him, more social support. But moving to the suburbs moves him away from temptation, so there is a situational dimension to moving to the suburbs. By the fourth interview, he says he's completely off drink, he's completely off drugs, there have been no further convictions, he says he has stopped offending, and he says that he has learned to think first, improved impulsivity, and to take more responsibility for myself, these are his words, and, but he still stays at home seven days a week to avoid his old group of friends, the situational dimension again. So you can see it's a very complicated scenario where many of these different factors are coming together. I have been given the green card, so I will skip for now the... <laughs> I will skip for now the gender and the different communities. We can perhaps come back to that. I will just talk about uh, six, about obstacles. You will have gathered already from Len's case that there are of, often obstacles. In the Sheffield study, we asked about obstacles with a standard list. 
These were the top six obstacles. They were in the same order in each of the four interviews. The good news was the obstacles were declining as you went from interview one to interview four. But the obstacles are interesting. The first two are about money. Again, this is something that is not in the desistance literature. But they, the offenders told us when we asked them that desistance, if you have been a persistent offender, means living on a lower income than you have been used to because you have been taking a lot of money uh, for a crime and if you're just living on a low wage or benefits, you are on a reduced income. And I mentioned this in a recent presentation on desistance that I gave to a group of prisoners in England and one of them afterwards said, yeah, of course that's obvious. I can steal as much in three hours as I can earn in a week. It's obvious that money is a major issue, but we don't talk about it, but we should. Uh, and lack of work, of course, is a problem, and I know it's a problem in Spain. Uh, and this is interesting. Remember, these were 20, but they said, you know, we miss the excitement. Ex offending is exciting. And that's again part of this transition from uh, adolescence to the maturity that you, know, you move away from the excitements towards the notion of responsibility. You might be surprised that drugs is at number six, but actually, rather than number one, but actually that's because only about half of the offenders that we had were on drugs. And if you were on drugs, it was number one obstacle. Now, thank you, uh, Pepe, for saying I should move on. So here are the implications for criminology, in my opinion. Criminology needs, criminology has spent a lot of time looking at why people offend. It has spent less time looking at why people don't offend. Looking at why people don't offend, especially if they have been offending, can tell you a lot about criminal policy and is very interesting. Uh, I have written myself about this, don't have time to talk about it, but I believe that instrumental, normative, situational and uh, habitual or routine factors are all very important and interact with each other. Criminology also needs to understand changes in people's moral understandings. And one of the things that, that we have not yet done in desistance literature, it is reasonably clear now that there is a difference between early desistance and late desistance. Early desistance, as you will have gathered from some of the case histories, is just about how on earth do I change? It's just a, you know, I need to change somehow. Uh, later desistance is much more about people begin to think more about the kind of people they've hurt in the past. They begin to think about other people. They begin to think about leading a life. They begin to think about their new identity. This is a significant change from early desistance to late desistance. We know almost nothing yet about how it happens but it's pretty clear that there is a change. What are the implications for criminal policy? I just give you four implications for criminal policy and you can then attack me afterwards. The, <laughs> the four implications are, first, we need to consider offenders' strengths and resources as well as risk and criminogenic needs because most offenders want to desist. Yes, of course, they have risks and criminogenic needs, and we need to take those into account. But we also need to remember that they want to desist and work out how to help them to desist. Secondly, rehabilitation, at least in my country, maybe not in Spain, rehabilitation has too often not realized that people want to desist and has thought we can change people by a program that we 
give to them. Programs are important, programs do work. I believe in the not I believe that the not that the what works uh, literature has shown that, for example, cognitive behavioral treatment can help. But it needs to be seen not as something that is just given to an offender, but something that fits into this emerging process uh, of desistance. But we also need to realize that desistance can be harmed by various aspects of social policy. For example, if there is no work and we maybe think about providing sheltered work or so on, the impact of criminal records is being particularly studied in the United States. Driving disqualifications is really quite interesting. In England anyway, I don't know about Spain, people get, people of the kind we were studying get long driving disqualifications, quite often for offenses that don't actually involve driving, things like, or driving dangerous, things like driving a car without insurance, but there's no crash, um, but you get a long disqualification. But actually, one of the few skills that many offenders have is driving. So if we could, you know, that's another possibility. And finally, in most countries, including, I believe, Spain, there is a standard policy that if you have more convictions, you get a longer sentence. But if desistance is, as it is, a gradual process, then the court, I think, needs to possibly start considering real evidence that the person has begun to change. And if there is evidence that the person has begun to change, then this would be good evidence, this would be a good reason for uh, mitigating the extra punishment for, desist for, for uh, recidivism in that case. Thank you for listening. Tenemos 15 minutos para exactamente para preguntas, por tanto, quien quiera empezar van a pasaros el micro. Pueden ser tanto en castellano como en catalán, como en inglés, la lengua que, prefer que prefiráis. Adelante. ¿Queréis que empiece yo para animar un poco? No, Marta, adelante. Tienes que pasar aquí el micrófono, por favor. Thank you, Professor Bottom, because it has been a really a nice uh, contribution, very clear and um, very inspiring. Uh, I would like to ask about um, the desistant process uh, that you have been talking about, and if um, uh, more than uh, we were talking about the, uh, that the, in this process uh, people can do less offenses yeah. uh, and I, I will ask about <coughs> the severity of these offenses mm -hmm. is also a, a decreasing uh, mm -hmm. level of severity in the, in the process yeah. when the assistance yeah. is taking place yeah. Yeah. thank you um, <clears throat> yes, uh, usually that is the case. Um, usually what happens is that um, <clears throat> they begin a process of desistance and they move away from their most severe um, offenses, but they will continue to commit minor thefts and things like that. Um, and eventually they would stop. Yeah. Of course, this is not a universal, but uh, that is the general tendency. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Did you say you had a slide about gender and subgroups? Could you yeah. go back to that and talk a bit? Sure. Okay. 
so far as gender is concerned, um, <clears throat> the, um, first of all, there are, th this is still an emerging field of research, and there are very many fewer studies of women offenders than men, particularly because desistance research has focused on persistent offenders, and as you will all know, uh, there are many fewer persistent female offenders than male ones. So for all these, I mean, we actually, in the Sheffield study, we tried to get a sample of female offenders as well as males, but applying the same criteria, uh, we've, we found about five, uh, and so we had to abandon that part of the study. But there have been some studies. Uh, in general, I would say the best study is by Peggy Giordano, uh, whose work I mentioned on cognitive transformation, and in fact, the main part of her analysis uh, is on women. Her general view, uh, which is again expressed in, this, in the article in the new book, um, <clears throat> is that uh, there are many similarities <clears throat> in the patterns of desistance for men and for women. However, there is a significant difference uh, and that is that for male offenders, almost any woman they meet will be less criminal than they will. Uh, whereas for female offenders looking for a male partner, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, and obviously if you marry or uh, become partners with a seriously uh, criminal uh, offender, this is, is, is not so good. Um, uh, and also it is the case that uh, women um, find it more difficult to find a be perhaps because there is more stigma because of what is sometimes called the double gender effect. There is more stigma in being a persistent female offender than in being a persistent male offender. Uh, it is actually harder to find a romantic partner anyway. Um, uh, and so uh, the romantic partner dimension is less prominent uh, in female uh, desistance studies than for males. So far as uh, the, uh, there is another study by somebody called Andrea Leverenz, also in the United States, and she argues that a, it's, this is a qualitative study and she, again, is looking at gender, the way in which we view gender roles. And, these, and the women in her study, uh, they were trying to desist, but that meant trying to avoid some of the past situations which were quite closely related to their family circumstances. But at the same time, uh, they were expected to play some kind of a caring role in, and they themselves had internalized the notion that they needed to be good mothers, good carers, uh, and so on. So Leverend says that there is actually more of a conflict for women in this area of caring, that they want to be good carers, but actually many of their problems relate to the caring dimensions uh, of the past. As regards communities, I will skip the English and just talk about the uh, Sid and Marti analysis in Catalonia, where among the um, immigrant group, which was quite a large percentage of the sample, the immigrant group divided into two, two subgroups, one of whom were quite similar to the Spanish and had quite a long history of offending. But the other group uh, was a group of people who had not offended in their uh, original um, community, but then offended when they came to Spain. But then they expected to be able, they said well, they were in effect first offenders, they expected to be, after leaving prison, to be able to resume 
uh, a good life to support their families and so on and so forth, but they then hit, through the stigma of having a criminal record, they then hit some major structural obstacles. And so they actually, ironically, although in one sense they were good risks, they actually had more structural difficulties than many of the Spanish people because they had much less, many, many fewer systems of social support than the Spanish system. I hope I've got that right. Um, so, you know, so you do get differences in communities uh, and, and in gender, and these things are all part of the, uh, the complicated picture of desistance. I would like to depend on the on the influence of uh, having a shop or being offered a shop in, in the process of desistance. Uh, I read an article, sorry, but I don't remember the author, that uh, explained uh, a research he had carried out. And he, he said that it was not that being offered a, a shop or having a shop uh, helped with desistance, but that accepting a shop was a sign and evidence that there was a will to, to, to desist. So it was the, the other way around. I would like you to comment about that. Yeah. Uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this is, um, I'm not sure whether everybody heard that. Would you like to translate it? Tu mateis, Paco. Okay. Ah, ah, sí, sí, no. Yo, yo comentaba que, que leí un artículo, perdóname, pero no recuerdo el autor, en que el autor explicaba una, una investigación empírica que había llevado a cabo con, con personas que habían desistido y, y decía que no era tanto que el, el hecho de, de que les ofrecieran un trabajo, de que tuvieran un trabajo ayudaba a desistir, sino que el hecho de buscar un trabajo o de aceptar un trabajo era un, una evidencia, un signo de que ya se había producido la decisión de desistir. Pido si puede comentar sobre esto. Yes. If you remember the case study of Len that I showed you, uh, in his case, going out and committing this further crime and getting drunk was actually very important. Uh, you, in some ways, you could see this as a turning point in his life. Um, he had begun to desist. He had been homeless. He'd been in a hostel. He'd begun to desist. He'd been improving his relationship with his mother. And then one night, he goes out and gets drunk, commits a further, further crime. Uh, and this acts as a, for him, this acted as a shock. And things improved from then on. So, but I think what is behind your question is, well, why do things improve? Maybe this could be the start of uh, a further slide into worse criminality. And of course, it could. And everything depends, as you rightly say, on how someone responds to that particular shock. And this is, this is why I am actually quite attracted by the uh, cognitive transformation theory of, um, uh, of Giordano, uh, which is cognitive, but also is, through, the, through her acceptance of symbolic interactionism, is linked to social situations. And I think what was central in Len's case was that through being homeless, he had already decided that this was not a sensible way to live, that being an offender was not a sensible way to live, and he was trying to change. According to his own, I haven't put this on the slide, but according to his own self-report study, he was still committing a few offenses. This was what we, the gradual dimension. And then one night he does this crazy thing, gets drunk and so on. I think if he had not already had the slight cognitive change, I need to desist, my relation with my mother is improving, etc., etc. I think his, re his reaction to the new conviction would have been very different. 
It is because, as you rightly say, what matters in a new situation is the, at, the attitude that you bring to the situation. And I'm sorry, I can't read this in Spanish, but uh, <laughs> she talks about the hooks for change, but it's also how you react to those hooks for change. And it's, the, it's very much that interactive process that is important. And, in, and also the support that you were talking about from his mother clearly at once at an earlier stage relations with his mother had completely broken down but because of changes they, she was now an important support bueno. <coughs> me temo que no tenemos tiempo para más preguntas eh... Os agradezco tanto al profesor Bottoms como a todos los que han participado y a todos los que habéis atendido vuestra presencia y seguimos con el Congreso. Thank you very much. Gracias.